Okay, hi everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Graham Cornwell. I'm Assistant Dean for Research here at the Elliott School. Feeling a bit of adrenaline uh, for those in the room. This is the first in-person book launch we've had in 20 months. So that we used to do, yeah. Uh, kind of as a matter of, of course, um, but, uh, but haven't done it in a long time and just to sit and, and have coffee and listen to, to our scholarship together. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome you in person and those online. We're so happy to expand our community around the country and the world um, for this really special event. Um, today, we are celebrating the launch of a book, Promoting Justice Across Borders, Political Theory for the New Global Politics from Oxford University, pressed by our own Professor Lucia Raffanelli. Uh, Lucia is Assistant Professor of Political Science and International Affairs here at the Elliott School. Um, her more extensive bio is available through the, uh, through the invitations we sent out. Um, and we have an esteemed, discussed, and moderator, our own Dean of the Elliott School, Alyssa Ayers, um, joining us as discussant and, and moderator today. Um, before I turn it over, I just want to say thank you to, um, to Diane Sang and Kyle Renner for working really hard to organize this, and hopefully we get lucky on the tech front and, and have a, a smooth hybrid event. And also a big thank you to the Institute for International Economic Policy, the Humanitarian Action Initiative, um, and our LEAP Initiative, um, plus our colleagues in the Department of Political Science and, um, and Department of Philosophy for, for co-sponsoring this. Before I turn it over to Dean Ayers, um, I just want to say for those of you in the chat, you know, we will obviously do a Q, or those of you online, we will do a Q&A afterwards. Please enter your questions in the chat and we will uh, make sure they get to our moderator today. Um, okay, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dean Ayers. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Can everyone hear me? Great. It's so nice to be able to celebrate this book. It, first of all, nice to be here in person for a book launch. Uh, we did one book launch last week. It was virtual. Nice to be hybrid to have that in-person dimension. But what's also special about this book launch is that it is Professor Refinelli's first book. So it's always nice to be able to celebrate a first book, and I hope you will all join me in congratulating her on this very elegantly written and logically argued book. Let me just say a couple words uh, about the book before we turn things over to Professor Raffanelli. What Promoting Justice Across Borders does is to offer a way of thinking about engagements around the world designed to elicit certain outcomes in a much more methodical and nuanced and robust way than simply thinking about international engagement or interventions as military-led wars or you know, uh, efforts to change regimes. Professor Raffanelli looks at different kinds of cases that cross borders, and she develops a, a very expansive theory of reform interventions and the framework under which certain kinds of reform interventions could be moral. She also asks us to think in a more nuanced way about toleration, about state legitimacy and ideas of collective self-determination. In a world of global trade, of global migrations, of global media, global influences and state policies that at times act extraterritorially, her broader theory of reform intervention and the moral, what she terms the global duty of justice, offers much for us all to think about as scholars, as students, as practitioners and as citizens. So congratulations again. Let me turn now to Professor Raffanelli, who will present the arguments in promoting justice across borders, and she will ask us to consider some cases ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Let me just get my situated here. Right. So um, I'm assuming we have a bit of an interdisciplinary audience here tonight. That's one of the great things about being at the Elliott School. So I just want to start off by saying a little bit about how I understand my own work in political theory and how I understand the relationship or potential relationship between political theory and real world politics. So as I said, I'm a political theorist. My research focuses on asking moral questions about political institutions, political choices, 
you know, what does justice require? What does it mean to treat people as equals, to treat people fairly? How should we design our institutions, social and political institutions to kind of live up to those values? And often that work involves a lot of sort of abstract theorizing. And so sometimes people wonder, I think, well, what's the relevance for real world politics? And my own view is that political theory can give us the tools we need to sort of conscientiously address political moral questions that we all face every day as political actors. This might be sort of obvious political questions like the kinds we face when we're citizens in a voting booth trying to decide which politicians to support or we're policymakers, or maybe we work for an NGO or a development organization, but also you know, smaller decisions that we all make every day about what charities to support, what companies to patronize, what activist movements to support or join or uh, kind of resist against or oppose. All of those are political choices. And especially in today's globalized world, they often have the potential to have impacts beyond our own society. And I think it's important that we sort of address those choices thoughtfully and conscientiously. And again, I think that political theory can help give us the tools to do that. And with that said, I also wanna say uh, uh, maybe another caveat or framing, framing comment about how I want you to kind of engage with or interpret the book, uh, which is that I don't want you to think of it as a set of commandments that you know, should never be questioned, that lays down the be all end all answers for every question about the ethics of intervention. Um, but I, I really would rather you take it as a sort of invitation to reflect on your own views and values uh, about uh, views and values that you endorse about the ethics of intervention. Of course, the views in the book are, are mine. I argue for them, and maybe you'll find my arguments persuasive. Um, but again, I really want you to take it as an invitation to approach those political choices that you might be making in your life in a sort of reflective and conscientious way. So with that, I'll kind of jump into the, the substance of the book. So the main question behind the book is this question of when, if ever, are attempts to promote justice in foreign societies morally justified? And I call attempts to promote justice in foreign societies in the book, I call them reform interventions. And you'll notice that that category is a very broad category. Um, and so I do want to sketch a few cases uh, for you to think about. These are kind of the kinds of cases I talk about in the book. So, uh, you know, maybe helpful for us to just sort of start out thinking about these cases, what are our initial thoughts um, or, or instincts about what are the moral issues they raise. So one kind of case I want to highlight is in the early to mid 2000s, the US signed a preferential trade agreement with Oman, and it had a number of human rights conditions attached to it. In particular, they related to the protection of workers human rights. And then the lead up to the trade deal, the US sort of leveraged its outsized market share in the global economy, geopolitical power, to get Oman to agree to commit to a number of workers' rights reforms. And so this was a case where, you know, arguably the United States is trying to promote justice in some sense in Oman, using their geopolitical power to do that, um, but not doing it so kind of forcefully or directly as you might uh, think of that usually happening with military intervention. Another case I want to highlight is, again, in the, in the 2000s, we saw an export ban um, in Europe coming out of the European Parliament, um, a number of European drug companies and European countries' governments, where they banned the export of lethal injection drugs to the United States. And they pitched this explicitly as an effort to contribute to a sort of global movement against the death penalty. Um, and so again, here we see these European actors. So I argue in the book, this is how we should interpret them trying to promote their ideas of justice in the United States, effectively by stopping the US from, um, from exercising the death penalty by stopping the export of these drugs. And the third kind of case I wanna highlight is sort of transnational consumer boycott and divestment movement. Um, you might think of the boycotts that happened against Nike as part of the anti-sweatshop movement as one example of this. Um, so again, here we have sort of transnational actors trying to promote their ideas of justice about workers' rights um, by creating some kind of political change or, or social change in foreign societies where you know, sweatshops, for example, sometimes are located. Um, but again, the, none of these cases, and maybe especially the last one, I think might be the kinds of things that we think of when we hear the word intervention. So um, I think you know, often when we hear the word intervention, we're probably thinking about 
as Dean Ayers was saying, sort of military humanitarian interventions. Um, states using their militaries or other kind of conventional coercive tools of foreign policy to produce some change in, in foreign states. But one of the thoughts behind the book is that cases like the ones I just described raise similar moral questions to those more sort of familiar paradigmatic examples of military humanitarian intervention. And so they should be kind of getting some more attention than they do. So this is one motivating idea behind the book, that there's just a lot of stuff that goes on in global politics um, that doesn't get the attention it deserves, at least in the political theory literature on the ethics of intervention. Um, that literature is, with a few exceptions, sort of narrowly focused on thinking about the ethics of military humanitarian interventions or occasionally the ethics of states using coercive sanctions as a method of intervention. But as the three cases I just sketched illustrate, there's really a lot more stuff that goes on in global politics. There are a lot more ways that all kinds of different global political actors try to promote their own ideas of justice in other societies. Um, in other words, there are a lot of different ways to engage in reform intervention. So one thing the book does is to develop a typology of reform intervention. So I kind of identify a few different dimensions along which reform interventions can vary that I think are likely to be morally significant and explore their moral significance in the book. I'm just gonna kind of go through those dimensions here. Of course, I can't do justice to everything I say in the book in this short time, but hopefully this will give you some idea um, of, of what I say and what I argue for. So one dimension that I think interventions can sort of vary along that's morally significant is the degree of control that interveners exercise over recipients. So on you know, one end of the spectrum here, we have non-controlling or persuasive interventions. So those are interventions where the interveners really are not exercising any control over recipients, but they're just trying to convince them, to persuade them to adopt a certain kind of policy or a certain kind of behavior. On the other end of the spectrum, we have totally controlling interventions. So those are maybe the more familiar military interventions where interveners are literally um, sort of forcing recipients to do what they want. Recipients basically have no choice but to go along. And in the middle of that spectrum, there's some variation. So in the category that I call slightly controlling interventions, Interveners are sort of incentivizing some ways of acting or, or uh, the, the choice to adopt some laws or policies and disincentivizing others, but they're not actually taking away any options. And it's still true that recipients have a sort of reasonable alternative um, to acting as interveners wish. And so this category is where I put the Oman case that I just described. So in that case, Oman had an interest in getting this preferential trade deal with the US in particular, they wanted to diversify their economy because it was dependent at the time on some oil reserves that it seemed would run out in a few decades, but they weren't on the brink of economic collapse. It wasn't as if they needed the trade deal in such a dire way that they had to just agree to the terms the US proposed, whatever they were. So that was a case where, yes, the US was leveraging its power to sort of get Oman to adopt certain reforms, but the Omani people, the Omani officials still could have refused. That was still a reasonable option open to them. Then moving a little, a little down the spectrum is a category that I call highly controlling intervention. And this is where interveners are again, incentivizing and disincentivizing different options, different ways of behaving. Um, but they had, the cost they attach to recipients sort of deviating from what interveners want them to do is so high that at, that deviation is not really a reasonable option open to them. So in this category, I put some of the structural adjustment programs the World Bank and IMF imposed on several countries, uh, including in Latin America and elsewhere in the 1980s. So in some of those cases, um, you know, the, the countries were, were sort of on the brink of economic collapse. They did badly need loans. And so they kind of had no choice um, but to agree to whatever political conditions the willing lenders um, attach to their loans. And so those were cases uh, in, that, that belong in this category where though interveners are not sort of literally using force, they are making it the case that recipients have no reasonable option but to comply with the intervener's wishes. The next couple of dimensions I'll go through more quickly because I think they're pretty intuitive. But the basic idea here is that 
you know, though all reform interventions by definition are aiming at promoting justice, some requirements of justice are arguably more, you know, morally urgent than others. Um, and also different interventions are going to pose different risks, different costs for people in the recipient societies. Um, and so one thing that'll be morally significant when we're evaluating a given intervention is, you know, what are the urgency of the objectives the interveners are trying to achieve? Perhaps more importantly, what are the urgency of objectives that they are actually likely to achieve? And what kinds of risks are they imposing on recipients by engaging in their intervention? And the final dimension I want to highlight is the relationship that an intervention has to recipients' existing political institutions. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of move down the spectrum here. So on the, the sort of one end of the spectrum, we have what I call intrasystemic interventions. And these are interventions that actually work through the political institutions of the recipient society. So one of the cases I talk about in the book is in 20, about 2010, Arizona passed uh, this sort of infamous, now infamous immigration law um, called SB 1070. It, among other things, allowed uh, sort of warrantless detention it of people that police officers suspected to be undocumented. Um, it required immigrants to sort of obtain and be able to produce immigration papers. Um, and that law was challenged and it went through the US court system and a bunch of Latin American countries got together and uh, submitted amicus briefs to the US Supreme Court sort of arguing against the law. And in those briefs, they invoked ideas about the rights, not only of their own citizens, but also of Latin Americans living in the United States who they thought would be unfairly targeted by this law. So this is a case where these countries um, were, again, trying to promote justice in the United States by trying to get this law they thought that they thought was unjust overturned, but they were doing that by working through the US court system, not by sort of challenging it or interfering with it in any way. And moving along the spectrum, um, we have what I call extra institutional interventions. And those are interventions that take place kind of outside the formal political institutions of the recipient society. So this is where I would put the sort of consumer boycott and divestment campaigns that I mentioned earlier. So again, those are, those are movements that are trying to create political change, often in the name of justice, but they're not really working directly through the formal political institutions of the recipient society. They're working within civil society. Um, moving along, the next category I call oppositional interventions. And those are where the interveners are interfering with some aspect of the operation of recipients' institutions, but they're not trying to kind of overthrow recipients' institutions wholesale. So the export ban that I talked about earlier, I put in this category. So again, we can interpret that as the European actors sort of trying to prevent the US from enforcing certain of its laws, namely those laws that call for the death penalty. Um, but they're not trying to overthrow the whole US government, for example. And finally, on the far end of the spectrum, we have regime change interventions, maybe the more, you know, sort of familiar paradigmatic kind of intervention, um, where the interveners really are trying to overthrow recipients political institutions wholesale. Okay, so what can this typology of intervention tell us about the ethics of intervention? That brings us to the kind of second motivating idea behind the book, which is that I argue if we pay attention to the wide range of forms that reform intervention can take, we'll discover that the most common moral objections to reform intervention um, are not equally persuasive against all types of reform intervention. So I'm just going to kind of briefly highlight these common objections, and I think they'll sound familiar to you. So often people argue that justice promoting interventions are wrong because they're intolerant, they treat recipient societies intolerantly or because they disregard or disrespect the legitimacy of recipients' political institutions, or because they undermine recipients' collective self-determination. And again, the argument of the book is that these objections are sort of morally serious, um, and they are sometimes decisive objections against intervention. But they're not always decisive objections against intervention. And to tell when they are or are not decisive, we have to have recourse um, to thinking about the different types of reform intervention and their morally significant differences. Um, so in the last 
couple of minutes, I just want to kind of go through a couple of the guidelines that I put forth in the book. Um, I come up with a lot of complicated and intricate principles that I won't try to rehearse here, but um, I do also come up with a couple of general guidelines that I think are sort of good presumptions to have in the, in the absence of a case-by-case -case analysis. Um, so one guideline I argue for is that we should have a presumption in favor of less controlling interventions. And one reason for that is that I think less controlling interventions are sort of less likely to treat recipient communities intolerantly, because in those interventions, interveners are not simply imposing um, their own views on recipient societies, but recipient societies actually play a role in deciding whether or not they want to uptake the policies interveners are advocating. I also think that we live in a very non-ideal world with lots of bad actors and misinformed actors and inept actors um, and lots of disagreement about what justice requires. And I suspect in a world like that, it will be preferable to have power sort of a little less concentrated um, and to have the, the exercises of power that are undertaken by reform intervention be able to be contested. And so I think that presumption sort of brings us in that direction. And I argue for a presumption as well in favor of what I call counter hegemonic interventions, by which I mean interventions where the interveners are less currently and historically geopolitically powerful than the recipients. And in brief, I argue for this presumption because I think these kinds of interventions are less likely to undermine recipient society's collective self-determination, less likely to set up the kind of dominating or neocolonial relationships that do that. Um, and also I suspect that less powerful interveners will be less likely um, to be able to kind of impose their will on others without um, the requisite sort of information or justification to back them up. So what does this all mean for us? The one thing it means, I think, is that if, if these objections, the sort of common objections to reform intervention that I sketched before are not always persuasive, this means that justice promotion is sometimes a defensible goal to adopt, um, even when we're not just engaging in domestic politics, but we're engaging in global politics, politics with and for people in other societies. Um, and I think one thing this means is, again, that we should be reflective about how our own choices can help promote justice around the world. And that not only means thinking about how we can try to influence and make change uh, for other people, but also it means thinking about how we can open up our own lives and our own societies to potentially justice promoting influence from elsewhere. All right, uh, so thank you. I'm gonna stop there and I think we'll transition to the discussion portion. Thank you. We're gonna follow up with a couple questions that are gonna allow Professor Raffanelli to talk in a little bit more detail about how she would apply her theory. Um, you've talked about the global duty of justice. You've talked about toleration and you've talked about power imbalances across societies. So talk to us a little bit about what your theory presents interveners are trying to change a recipient society according to the preferences of interveners, then how can they avoid treating recipient societies intolerant? Great, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna go through a couple more slides here. So, yes. Okay, so great. So this is the sort of toleration objection. Um, so the worry being that interveners will necessarily treat recipients intolerantly if they're trying to promote their own ideas of justice or their own preferences. So what I argue in the book um, is that we should understand treating someone tolerantly as treating them as presumptively entitled to live by their own lights. So presumptively entitled to live lives that are sort of the products of their own choices and values. And that's how we should understand what it means to treat someone tolerantly. And what I argue is that interveners can sort of practice toleration even as they're trying to make change in other societies by both doing things that promote tolerant treatment in those societies, or at least don't discourage tolerant treatment, um, and also doing those things in ways sort of using means that themselves treat people tolerantly. Um, and for that, to figure out what that means, I sort of go back to this, um, this typology that I talked about earlier, and in particular, the ideas about control. Um, so one of the core ideas being that when interveners exercise less control, they're not simply sort of imposing their own views 
on the recipient society, but the policies that they um, you know, sort of advocate for, particularly in the persuasive and slightly controlling types of intervention, the policies will really only get taken up in the recipient societies if there's buy-in from the recipient people themselves. Um, and so we shouldn't think that those interventions are sort of treating recipients as if they can't make their own choices about how to live their lives, because in fact, they are gonna be the ones making the choices about whether to adopt whatever policy or behavior the interveners are advocating. There's something else that you go into in the book, and that is to, to think about um, a spectrum of legitimacy of states and to take into account that spectrum of legitimacy of states when thinking about whether a particular type of an intervention is moral or not moral. So uh, talk to us a little bit more about this. There's a, a kind of generally held belief that uh, legitimate states should should be protected from or be immune to an intervention. Does that necessarily imply that that a recipient state should have an illegitimate uh, uh, state government in order to be a morally acceptable uh, recipient of an intervention? Great. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so I I don't think it does imply that. Um, and the, the reason is what you kind of highlighted earlier in your question, which is that I argue that legitimacy, we should think of it as something that's scalar rather than binary. Um, so whereas this legitimacy objection says, well, reform intervention, it's gonna be wrong because it you know, disregards or disrespects recipient institutions legitimacy. Um, one of the things I argue in the book is that that's not necessarily true of all types of reform interventions. Um, even when recipient states really do have legitimate institutions, or at least partially legitimate institutions. Um, so uh, it's true that I think often we tend to think of legitimacy as this binary, so either a state is legitimate fully or illegitimate, not at all. Um, but really, I think we should understand that as a scalar. And one of, one of the things I argue in the book is that, you know, basically any standard we could imagine for, you know, what it means for a state to be legitimate could be achieved more or less well. And so it makes sense for us to think um, that states could achieve legitimacy to some degree, but not the full degree. And um, that also allows us to have a little bit more nuance in our sort of normative judgments about intervention. And another thing I argue in the book is, again, with recourse to the, to the typology, that depending on an intervention's relationship to the recipient society's institutions, it might actually be compatible with them even being fully legitimate. So interventions like in intersystemic interventions or some extra institutional interventions that don't really challenge the operation of recipient society's institutions, I think could be justifiable even if those institutions really are fully legitimate. And that's the example of the Arizona. Right, yeah, so, so right in that example, you know, again, it's the interveners sort of working through this, through the US court system not challenging the legitimacy of the US court system or the US government. Um, and there are other kind of cases like that too, where you see you know, bringing suit or submitting briefs to foreign courts as a way of promoting justice in another society that doesn't at all um, challenge the authority of the institutions in that society. Let me ask one last follow-up to get to the last part of your argument and then we'll open it up. I know we've got some questions that have come in online and we have a live chat and of course we are also in person here. Uh, but let me ask you to talk a little bit about, uh, there's a discussion in your book about collective self-determination. Is reform intervention or can reform intervention be consistent with a uh, recipient society's own self-determination? Yeah, um, so I, I think the answer is yes. And I argue in the book, there are some cases where it can be, and there might even be some cases where reform intervention can sort of help bolster a recipient society's self-determination, um, not just not undermine it. Um, so one thing I, I talk about in the book is you know, there are all these different ways that we might think reform intervention could potentially undermine recipient society's collective self-determination. So it might subject recipients to a sort of dominating relationship, so a kind of relationship where um, interveners can sort of impose their will costlessly and at their discretion on recipient societies. We might think that it, it could perpetuate certain problematic hierarchies like neo-colonial hierarchies. Um, and we might think that it, it could make recipients governments sort of less responsive to recipients themselves and more responsive to interveners interests. And so I kind of go through each of these possibilities and, and kind of argue that, it, you know, they're not always going to be, they're not always going to come to fruition. So there'll be some kinds of reform interventions 
that don't dominate recipients, that don't reproduce neocolonial hierarchies, that don't um, uh, that don't necessarily make recipient governments less responsive to their own people. Um, and one, one thing that comes out of that analysis is the inner, the, the sort of guideline I highlighted earlier, that we should have this preference for counter hegemonic interventions, because I think those are less likely to say reproduce certain kinds of problematic hierarchies, they're less likely to create the kinds of dominating relationships where interveners have a sort of general power to just impose their will um, at their discretion. Um, so I won't go through all of these uh, in detail, just so we have, have some time to get to the Q&A. But uh, yeah, happy to say more if people are curious about that too. So we've got a number of questions that have come in online. And if you've got questions here in our in-person part, please raise your hand and we'll get to you. Let me pose a question that came in in advance. This is from Leah Glanzer. She asks, how do you see the concepts from the book applied to religious intolerance regarding, for example, LGBTQ rights? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and the, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think that, you know, I, I guess one thing I would highlight there, and I actually do, I talk about a sort of hypothetical case um, in the book where we could imagine um, the US trying to persuade the Chinese government to adopt um, sort of anti-discrimination laws, uh, anti-discrimination based on gender or sexual orientation. Um, and I sort of try to think through what that case would look like. Um, and in, in that discussion, I guess there are a couple of things that I would highlight that I think answer the, or you know, kind of go to the, the more general question as well. Um, so one of them is that I would say, you know, obviously promoting um, sort of anti-discrimination and promoting LGBTQ rights would be I think an end in itself that is compatible with the with the role with the with the value of toleration. So before when I said, you know, interveners in order to practice toleration, they should encourage tolerant treatment in recipient societies, or at least not discourage it. So I think an intervention kind of aimed at um, you know, protecting LGBTQ rights would, would meet that criteria. Um, and then I would say interveners should also use means that themselves treat recipients tolerantly. Um, and uh, basically what I think that means is that they should use means that ensure their preferred policies only get adopted if they're really supported by a representative segment of the recipient population. So that could mean trying to persuade the recipient population directly and you know, hopefully they'll be persuaded and, and sort of pass the law themselves or, or um, change their behavior themselves. Or it could mean the sort of light incentivization that goes along with slightly controlling intervention. Um, or it could mean trying to sort of impose a policy that's favored by the recipient population, uh, even if it's not currently favored by, say, the, the recipient government. Um, so if you have a government that's, you know, not necessarily fully represented, uh, representative of the people, that would be another kind of um, consideration to take into account. Do we have any questions in person? I have a, I have a long list online. Uh, Professor Shamba. Um, this way everybody online can hear you. I'm wondering if you distinguish at all between interventions that have some benefit to the intervener versus ones that are purely, say, done out of their values. And um, the reason I ask is your example about Oman, where when the U.S. intervenes on trade on labor standards, it's doing so in part to make sure to kind of prevent there being too much of a wage advantage in the other country. It's also because the U.S. prefers better labor standards, but it feels like that's different than say the LGBTQ example you were just discussing where it's more purely a values and not a, a, a pecuniary thing. Yeah, good, great question. Um, yeah, so I do talk about the issue of intervener motivations a little bit in the book, but I, I mostly talk about it to say, I don't think it'll be directly relevant to the sort of normative analysis I do most of the time. And the reason for that is, is just that I think that um, sort of motivations of an intervener are gonna be really important for evaluating you know, their merit as a moral actor, their character, um, but not so important for evaluating the moral merit of the action. So I tend to think the moral merit of the action is sort of independent of the motivations of the actor. Um, with one caveat, which is that I take it if uh, actors are motivated by lots of extraneous things besides their stated goals, they might be less likely to actually achieve their stated goals. And so, um, you know, insofar as we have to assess the you know, likely effects of an intervention in order to assess its morality, in that way, you could have an indirect role played by an assessment of the, the sort of motivation of the actor. But I don't think it'll make a direct difference 
um, to the assessment of the moral merit of the action. We've got another one from online, then we'll come to you. Was it a two finger follow up? Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up since we're on Oman, not sure we'll get back to it, but the, the question is really one of practical application over time. You said this was from 2005. So how did this work out? Did workers' rights in Oman improve in any significant way? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, so they did adopt a few reforms that seem to be in response to this sort of negotiating negotiation leading up to the trade deal. So for example, they expanded the rights granted to foreign workers within Oman. They um, had some meetings with the ILO that um, sort of culminated in them adopting some policies to more closely match the ILO's standards, um, guaranteeing rights like collective bargaining and unionization and rights against forced labor. Um, you know, the extent to which those things are, are fully lived out in practice, I think is, is imperfect. Um, Emily Hacker Burton, whose analysis I draw on heavily in the book when I talk about this case, does think, I mean, she argues that those reforms sort of wouldn't have been adopted at all, or they would have been adopted maybe very far into the future, if not for this trade deal. So I think there's some reason to think that, you know, it, it, it had the, the effect of making some progress, um, though I, you know, I wouldn't say that the situation is, is perfect now as a result. Thank you. Yep. We've got another that came in online. Um, this question is from Rui Marquez Pinto. The question is, why don't you speak of solidarity as a form of reform that can be incorporated into the concept of justice? Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I love this question um, because I do have a lot of thoughts about solidarity and I do think that it has a role to play in reform intervention. Um, and I mean, it's true in the book, I don't, don't use the word solidarity a lot, um, but I do kind of argue for this view that says, we should, we should generally prefer when reform interventions involve kind of collaboration between interveners and recipients, right? Again, this idea that, um, you know, in most cases it's gonna be better, not, not just more effective, but morally better if what's happening is policies are being implemented because people in the recipient society have decided those are good policies to implement, even if they're doing that in response to interveners advocacy or, um, you know, or incentivization or something. Um, and so in that sense, I think, you know, Having that attitude both helps uh, maybe cultivate solidaristic relationships across borders and also having solidarity across borders will help make that type of collaborative intervention more likely and more feasible. Um, and I have a sort of side project actually where I, um, a, a smaller article that I'm working on where I argue that we should not think of these sort of cross-border engagements as kind of adversarial conflicts that are like wars, but instead we should think of them as political struggles where, you know, you might have opponents and allies on both sides of the border. And you know, what, what you're trying to do when you're sort of trying to promote justice is look for the people on your side or on the other side of the border who can be your allies in that, in that pursuit. And one of the things that I said before was that I think you know, kind of takeaway from the book is that we should think of the pursuit of justice as something not just that we do with fellow citizens, but that we do with kind of all of humanity as a collective project. And I do think part of that is you know, developing the kinds of attitudes and relationships that produce the solidarity and the mutual respect and the capacity for mutual learning that will make it possible for us to engage in those sort of shared struggles. We have another in person. Yes, right here. I'm curious about um, counter hegemonic interventions. What kind of steps have to be taken to kind of execute an effective intervention if the intervener has less power kind of to effectively have that intervention against a institution or a state that has more power. Great. Um, yeah, thanks. And I mean, I'll answer with the caveat that I'm not an empirical political scientist, so I will defer to other people on any of these questions. Um, but I think I do have something to say, which is that um, one of the reasons I'm interested in talking about interventions that are sort of not the paradigm case, so not, you know, state-led military interventions or state-led sanctions, is because I think those conventional sort of channels of political power are often the ones that are most closed to people who are most disadvantaged, most oppressed in the world. And so I think looking at some of those maybe less conventional forms of intervention, like persuasion and advocacy, like transnational activism, um, like boycotts and divestment campaigns, I think those channels can be more open um, than say the channels of conventional you know, state power. 
Um, so I think that's one, you know, one thing to say is maybe we kind of look to just more diverse forms uh, of, of advocacy and justice promotion. Um, so, you know, the, the Latin American amicus briefs case is, is one example of a counter hegemonic intervention that seems like it might have done something. I mean, parts of the Arizona law were overturned and the judges did cite the briefs from Mexico and other Latin American countries in the decision. Um, there have been other sort of uh, court cases like that, but you also might think that, um, again, sort of boycott and divestment movements have the potential um, to sort of channel political power in ways that, uh, you know, maybe is, uh, it would be sort of hard to do if you were limited to thinking about um, using the conventional tools of state foreign policy. I saw a hand over here. Yeah. Did we meet this morning? Are you Chris? Yes. Nice to see you. Um, so I was uh, curious about like um, the dilemma of like, you know, an action that might not um, initially be that coercive, but triggers a more coercive reaction. So take, for example, the G7's financial action task force. Um, if they put you on the gray list, I mean, like that's mostly just naming and shaming. But what that triggers is like, you know, a withdrawal of investments from states that are concerned about the financial safety of um, their investments in the markets of those states on the list. So um, it may result in like a more, um, in an intervention that, um, you know, leads a state more disadvantaged than um, the original intervention. Good. Yeah, and I think that's a great example of thinking through it. I mean, um, I, I think my answer would just be that when evaluating sort of how much control interveners are exercising or how controlling an intervention is, we should be looking at the political context. So, um, you know, not necessarily just looking at one action they take in isolation. Um, so, you know, we could imagine a situation where, you know, one investor withdrawing is, you know, not exerting any control really or a minimal amount of control, but um, one investor withdrawing in the context where every investor is withdrawing is exerting an, a tremendous amount of control. Um, so I think, you know, I would just say we'd, we'd want to have a contextually dependent assessment of how much control is being exerted. We've got several questions that came in online. This one is a little bit long, but it provides a kind of scenario to think through. So let me uh, pose this one. It is from one of our alums. Emmanuel Gebeyehu, uh, he says he's a, he or she says recent alum. Um, okay, the prologue of promoting justice across borders raises the question of intervention without disrespecting a country's legitimate political institutions or undermining their collective self-determination. Suppose a country suffers from a wide range of issues. These issues include, I said it was a long question, but are not limited to fraudulent elections, the detainment and torture of peaceful political opposition leaders, the censorship of government dissidents, gross human rights abuses, societal division, multidimensional poverty, and genocide. Also suppose it is objectively demonstrated that the country cannot solve its problems internally due to the lack of will from the federal government. How can genuine global activists effectively intervene to influence grassroots change in the country, especially when they lack the same financial resources as powerful lobbyists, states, and NGOs seeking out their respective geopolitical interests? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, good. I mean, you know, again, I think I don't, I don't have any magic answers about, you know, what is going to be the most effective political strategy for promoting change in a given, a given situation. I mean, probably it's not possible to answer that, that question in the abstract anyway. Um, you know, I think a couple of, a couple of things I would point to um, is, you know, one of the things I, I, I argue for in the book, again, is the sort of importance of finding ways to collaborate with the local population, um, you know, when it's, when it's possible, finding ways to make sure that the policies that are implemented are ones that they endorse. Um, I, I mean, I also would point out, you know, since the beginning of the question talked about legitimacy, and, and I think maybe one thought behind the question was, you know, maybe a state like this one described doesn't actually have legitimate political institutions. Um, you know, I certainly, leave open that, that possibility in the book. So, um, I, you know, the position I take in the book is not that we should treat every state as legitimate all the time, um, but rather that, you know, we should make some assessment about legitimacy. Um, again, thinking of that as a scalar property rather than a binary one. 
Um, but then we should be sort of alive to the reality that different types of intervention, you know, some of them are premised on denying the recipient state's legitimacy, but not all of them are. Um, and sometimes it might be appropriate to deny the recipient state's legitimacy. Although I will say that, you know, another thing I say in the book is that when interveners are making that kind of judgment, that's one of the cases where I think there's an especially high risk of them sort of uh, perpetuating or reinforcing certain problematic, especially neocolonial hierarchies. Um, and so there's reason to think that if, uh, if an intervening state is making the judgment that a recipient state is illegitimate and should be treated as such, uh, at least in certain cases, those judgments should be not just made kind of by interveners on their own in isolation, but should be kind of confirmed by um, diverse and epistemically diverse global political actors. So it's not just kind of one intervener, again, sort of imposing, uh, imposing their own judgments kind of at their discretion. Do we have questions in person? Yes. I'm not sure I have this proposed here. I'm not sure I have this well formulated in my head, but I was trying to think through an Afghanistan example since it's in the news. Um, and it strikes me if, if broadly the question is how could one promote, how could reform minded folk promote justice in Afghanistan? And there strike me as a bunch of cleavages that you've laid out. Who is the self that's determining in Afghanistan? Um, you know, what can you, what could reform-minded people do about women? Um, is there a particular cosmopolitan trump card that gets played in your calculus because whole classes of people are, do, do some selves forfeit the self-determination capacity because their program is to do unjust things? How do you think through examples like that for us? Sure. Um, yeah, great, great set of questions. I mean, just to take the last one first, I think, um, so other people have made the argument that the purpose of collective self-determination is really just to allow people to achieve justice. And so insofar as they're doing, they're not doing that, they don't have a right to collective self-determination. I do not make that argument. Um, I actually think that groups of people do have a right to collective self-determination or rather individuals have the right to decide what kinds of policies govern their lives and that can translate into a sort of right of collective self-determination as part of political communities. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, I don't think that, you know, communities sort of forfeit their claim to that if they don't pursue justice or they don't achieve justice. Um, so, you know, thinking through, but I, but I don't think that that means there's nothing the international community can do to try to make it the case that, uh, that they achieve justice or at least get closer to justice. Um, I mean, it's hard to know what to say in the Afghanistan case. There are a lot of considerations to take into account. Um, it, it, is, it is true, I think, that there have been, I mean, there have obviously been protests uh, within Afghanistan against the Taliban including some protests led by women. So, I mean, one option might be to sort of look at, you know, how can, how can the international community sort of support those people? Um, the Taliban itself is also not homogenous, right? So, um, you know, there's, there's more questions there. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll just sort of end with, with one set of thoughts that I, I do talk about in the book, which is the question of, as I started to talk about a little bit earlier, what to do when the government of a society doesn't fully represent the people in the society. Um, and basically what I say there is that, um, you know, it's sort of the, the first best option would be for interveners to engage directly with the society itself um, rather than with an unrepresentative political elite. Um, maybe the second best option is for interveners insofar as they're going to advocate some policy to try to advocate a policy that's supported by the population itself. Um, and sort of, you know, even if, even if interveners are interacting with that unrepresentative elite, if they can try to, you know, get the elite effectively to, um, to kind of implement policies that are more in line with what the underlying population wants, that can be, that can be a good thing. And that can be a, a sort of way for interveners to practice toleration with respect to the people in the society, as opposed to the unrepresentative elites. So, I mean, those are a few maybe scattered thoughts, but that's kind of what I would say. We've got another that's come in online. I'm gonna ask this one. This is from Matthew McLeod Warwick. Do you think that the United States has a more complicated relationship with reform intervention given the neo-colonial relationship it has with many countries 
what could perhaps alleviate the power imbalance and give more legitimacy to United States reform? Yeah, um, another great question. Uh, so yes, I do think that, um, that the United States has a more complicated relationship to reform intervention than some other countries because of the sort of neo-colonial dynamics. In fact, in the book, when I talk about the Oman case, what I end up saying is that um, this is an intervention that's sort of considered in isolation, I think would be justified. Um, but in fact, it did reproduce problematic colonial hierarchies and that here we have the US um, you know, intervening, the US is a country that's privileged by these colonial hierarchies intervening in a country that's arguably been disadvantaged by them, intervening in the lives of people in a region that's been disadvantaged by them. Um, and so what I say in the book is that that sort of intervention could have been made permissible um, if the US did something else to sort of undermine that same neo-colonial hierarchy. Um, but I think it would be hard to argue that the US did in fact do something to undermine the, the, the hierarchy that sort of advantaged it. Um, so I think, you know, to bring it back to the more general question, what I would say is that um, I, I, sort of, I sort of am of the opinion that these hierarchies are, you know, there, they exist, they're power structures, and even the most powerful actors in the world can't help but act within those power structures. Um, but what they can do is do things that, you know, sort of try to, try to do something to undermine them or to invert them. Um, and so that I think is the obligation, you know, if a country is going to intervene in a way that reproduces one of these problematic hierarchies, it should also be doing something to try to sort of um, counteract that, uh, that sort of power. Do you have any, any, yeah, over here. Yeah, I guess just to follow up to that, could you provide any? Can, it, can everyone hear? We've got a mic coming over too. So the people online will be able to hear your question. Thank you. Yeah, just to follow up to that, could you provide an example of where you've seen, you know, countries that are more powerful doing something to undermine that? Sure. Yeah, um, so another one of the cases I talk about in the book is, and this is a, not a state intervention, but an NGO intervention. Um, so another one of the cases I talk about in the book is Tostan, which is this NGO that does sort of human rights and um, women's rights promotion in Western Africa. Um, the NGO is based in Senegal, but it also has offices in the US and a, a few other Western countries, and it was founded by an American woman. Um, and so I kind of treat it as a, a Western actor. Um, and so I think that its interventions, though, you know, there's a lot to like about them. Um, and I do think they're permissible at the end of the day. They're, they're persuasive interventions, so they're not kind of exercising control over the recipient communities they engage with. Um, but it is the case that, you know, at least if you kind of interpret it as I just suggested, you have this NGO that represents sort of wealthy Western interests trying to make change in, in Africa. Um, and so it has the, the, the sort of potential to reinforce those problematic colonial hierarchies. Um, and I argue that Tostan is actually doing things to sort of undermine those same hierarchies. And in particular, they use um, their, what Jennifer Rubenstein would call their discursive power in sort of subversive ways. Um, so if you look at kind of their materials on their website or that they distribute, they, um, they you know, kind of try to get away from the traditional ways of presenting people in the quote unquote third world or people in need as sort of, you know, desperate and isolated and sort of in need of saving. Um, and they really emphasize the agency of the communities they work with, the agency of the people. The pictures are pictures of people going to classes and doing work and doing activism. Um, and so I think they're sort of trying to use their platform to undermine some of those same hierarchies that give them privilege as a Western NGO. So that would be one kind of example. Yeah, I'm gonna take the prerogative of being the moderator to ask one last question. Um, Talk to us a little bit about what you would advise for our students to keep in mind as moral considerations as they embark upon their careers in international affairs. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I think one thing that I would say is just kind of what I started out with, which is this idea that we all make a million political choices every day and they often have the capacity to have effects beyond borders. And so I think just addressing those questions, you know, conscientiously and thoughtfully is a great start. Um, uh, you know, I would also say, I think being aware of the sorts of power structures and sort of background conditions in which we're all acting all the time is really important. Um, and so, you know, as the this last part of this conversation, I think is illustrated, uh, you know, that can affect the, the sort of moral assessment of even a well-intentioned 
um, intervention that you know aims at a, at a laudable end. And so that's one thing I think I would I would sort of you know push students and and just political actors in general to kind of be cognizant of. Do you have any last questions in the room before we wrap up? All right. Thank you. We we have I, I want to draw everyone's attention to our festive coffee in the back of the room. We're trying to get back to a little bit of normal. It's not as festive as it would be in the before times. Uh, but please join me in congratulating Professor Raffanelli on an excellent book. Across borders. Let me also thank all of you here for coming in person, everybody online, the great questions that came in ahead of time. We'll be giving away two books to the two questions that we asked in the beginning that came in online. Thank you to IIEP, to the Humanitarian Action Initiative, and to LEAP for co-sponsoring this terrific first ever hybrid book launch. May we have many more hybrid book launches that work out so well. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you.